Good morning. Welcome as we jump into the last church of the seven churches in Revelation. We've been in the first couple chapters here of looking at these seven churches, and we're going to finish today with the church at Laodicea and uh, look at what the Bible says. That'll be in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, if you want to go ahead and turn there. Um, you'll hear a lot today because of everything going on in the world around us uh, about the dangers of extremism. In fact, you'll hear all about that radicalism, uh, fanaticism, extremism. Uh, it oftentimes refers to viewpoints that, that are different than what is the norm or the middle way or what's existing, uh, some of those existing norms. So activities, uh, extremism can be defined as activities, beliefs, feelings, actions, strategies far removed from the ordinary. Uh, lending itself to radical change, revolution. That's extremism. And oftentimes it is viewed as a negative thing. However, uh, I think as we get into this church uh, today, you will find that there is a very different, a very particular perspective that God has about uh, uh, the extreme nature of their faith or the passion with which they serve the Lord or their love uh, for God and their service to Him that is um, uh, indicative not of extremism is not what they're warned about but rather the status quo uh, rather what they what's called the lukewarm so let's turn there revelation chapter 3 if you would stand with me as we read the word of god this morning revelation chapter 3 beginning at verse 14 <clears throat> the bible says this and to the angel of the church in laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you are either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, let's pray together. Father, well, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us today, God, as your word is preached. I pray, God, you would anoint my voice. You would anoint ears to hear, Lord, and not only to hear, but, Lord, may we be doers of your word. May we embrace what you have for us today, dear God, and desire with all that is within us, Lord, to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, you can be seated. <clears throat> Laodicea was described here as a lukewarm church. I wonder, uh, as it's described, you know, uh, a lukewarm church, what, what does that look like? What would that be like? In other words, could we identify the fact that we could be lukewarm? Could we identify if our heart for God is not where it should be? Uh, I'm not much of a coffee drinker. If you know me, I don't drink coffee. I don't like I love the way it smells if I'm at the store, but I don't like to drink it. I just don't think it tastes good or anything and uh, but if you go to a coffee shop I remember one time I went with someone and they were like don't worry they've got hot chocolate and uh, so I just got me a hot chocolate but uh, while I was there I noticed that they had lots of different kinds of who knew they had so many different kinds of coffee and so many different ways uh, to make that coffee they have of course the traditional hot coffee it's just hot coffee but I noticed that they also had iced coffee they have ice uh, that they put into the coffee to make it, I guess it's like iced tea, you know, being somewhat of a southerner, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like a good glass of iced tea. 
you know now if you're from england you think that's some kind of an abomination you're all about tea time and having your hot tea or whatever but uh but nobody likes lukewarm tea nobody likes lukewarm coffee it's just not something that anybody goes to uh, uh, uh previously when we looked at uh, uh the church that god said you're you know you're dead the sardis uh, uh, that they got a reputation of life, but they're dead, and they need to re- repent, wake up. Um, it said that I, I, I think I made the comment that the worst thing in the world is a dead church, but I think I need to change that and and let, just let you know that that's certainly a terrible thing, but and it needs to be repented of. So it's a, definitely a bad thing. But here we have this reality that. God is saying not just that this is something that should be rejected or turned from, but it's actually something, this lukewarm problem is something that the Bible says God will spit out of his mouth. Verse 16, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, that spit is kind of a a, a tame term for what this really is because it has more to do than just going and spitting. This has to do with vomiting. This is something that's a projected out of my mouth. This is hurled out of my mouth. It's a strong word that has a little more than spit. So you could really read in there, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, God's saying, I can't stand that you're straddling the fence when it comes to your love, your service to me. I, I can't stand that you would be indecisive about your love for me and your desire for me. I, I, I read a quote uh, I'm not sure who said it. It was an unknown quote, but it says, The nice thing about apathy is you don't have to exert yourself to show that you're sincere about it. The nice thing about apathy is you don't have to exert yourself to show that you're sincere about it. The fact that they they are a lukewarm church gives us some indication that there is some life in the church. All right, so it's the, the problem is distinctly different than being a dead church. There is some life. But they're not fully alive. It's kind of like mixing hot water and cold water. If you take hot water and mix it with cold water, you'll get lukewarm water. That's what you'll get. That's, that's, that's what it means. And so really the question is then, what does it look like for them to be alive, but not fully alive? To, to, be, uh, to have some spiritual uh, heat, but not being spiritually hot but just being lukewarm what does that look like in their life well i think number one it's not about theological or doctrinal errors Uh, if you're wrong or you reject biblical truth plain biblical truth that's not about being lukewarm that's about being dead in fact over and over we've looked at these other churches these other churches were rejected because some of them had accepted the teachings of, of De- Jezebel and her influence or the Nicolaitans or some had rejected those things and he's commending them for rejecting the false teachings that are going on or rejecting the things that are the change of the gospel and rejection of the basic fundamental truths of the gospel. So uh, doctrine is good and is important but it does not contribute to being lukewarm. You can have the right doctrine, you can believe right, you can believe the Word of God, and still be lukewarmness. In fact, I think the best description of lukewarmness is described in verse 17 of chapter 3 where we read, and he says this. He says, for you say, just talked about, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. I'm going to vomit you out. And here he, he sums it up in verse 17. For you say... I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. That there's a significant problem here. There is something missing in your life. Believing you're okay when you're not is a lukewarm problem. It's a lukewarm problem. Laodicea is condemned because they preferred just kind of a respectable morality rather than a passionate faith. They were involved in a casual religion. It was a comfortable religion. It didn't rock the boat. It didn't really help anybody. It didn't offend anybody, though. It didn't lead to any kind of transformation. It didn't glorify God. It was neither cold nor hot. It was the moderate approach. They took the centers. Let's not offend anybody. Let's not worry uh, uh, about 
about getting off on these edges. Let's not be too extreme. Let's not be too passionate in our worship. Let's not get too serious about this thing. Let's take the safe way. And they opted for safety over zealous good works. It was blind to its own lack. They believed they were rich and didn't need anything when there was a desperate need among them. I heard some churches now that after, uh, after, at the end of the service, after the sermon, they, uh, they pass out Red Bulls to everybody in attendance. Yeah, uh, I'm not opposed to that because they probably need it to make sure they're fully awake before they drive home. Uh, I've, I've sat in some services where it was so boring, it was so uh, 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 lukewarm that, that uh, it was hard to focus on anything. And I, uh, snoring sometimes is more stirring than many sermons and preached in pulpits across our land today. See, this idea of being extreme has just this negative feel that we reject because you have uh, Islamic extremists that are terrorists. So we, oh, whoa, 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 if you're extreme in your faith, you might be just like one of those terrorists. But in the church, we talk about peaceful, loving, kind, all those kinds of things. And we, but we can't dilute the full picture of God. We serve a holy God that is so radically different than the, anything else in this world that it is extreme to live out life in Jesus Christ. It is. In fact, God is saying that if it's not, then I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You're going to miss everything. What, is, what does it mean to be too extreme? Would it be too extreme for you to, to refuse at your workplace? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't stop talking about Jesus. I'm sorry that I'm not going to stop talk, telling people about what Jesus has done in my life. And then those same people uh, let you go from your job. And, and uh, Is that extreme? Is that extreme? Or let me ask you this, is it extreme that we would get to heaven and there are so many people, in fact, I've, I've asked Christians from time to time, how many people have you personally led to Jesus Christ in your life? I'm not asking last month or last year, but you look at the early church and what was happening. It says people were coming to Christ daily. They didn't wait till Sunday to bring them to church so they'll get saved at the altar. They, they prayed with them where they were. They were passionate about it, and they were doing it on a regular basis. There was an extremism in Jesus Christ. They refused to be lukewarm. And I think we've settled for it. And may I offer to you that God is not interested in the center way, in the compromising way, in the lukewarm position. God is not con uh, consumed with the stability of your life. He's not worried that everything be just so-so in your life. All your plans, all your will be accomplished in your life. God has a plan. He has a will. We are consumed by so many other things. Why are we lukewarm? Well, I think because it's comfortable. It's comfortable to be lukewarm. It doesn't take work it doesn't take effort to be room temperature you need not do anything we have uh, we have an oven in our house because there are some foods that in the preparation of them uh, must uh, must must be cooked and uh, we have a refrigerator uh, in our home because there are some things that must be kept cooler than the room temperature it always requires electrical outlet or gas or something to provide energy to take away from what is room temperature, either going hot or going cold. So we have heating and air conditioning. They do the same thing. But to be lukewarm requires no sacrifice. It requires no effort. It requires nothing. You, you barely have to show up. And your heart can be divided among so many other things. that uh, You can be consumed with lots of different things and not make Jesus the priority of your life. Yes, love him, but he doesn't have to be the priority in your life. A lot of lukewarm Christians today and the things of God are at the bottom of their priority list. Oh, uh, man, it's just other things are more important. It's amazing to me how many people will just skip church for things that do not matter. And by doing so, they, 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 uh, they in, imply to their children, to their family to their friends, to the people around them, that um, worship of God is, is not the most important thing. I read an article about um, uh, 30 to 50 million armadillos. 
we don't have armadillos here in Indiana, but 30 to 50 million armadillos live in the U.S. Every year, about a quarter to a half a million will be killed in the road. They get run over. The sight of their smashed carcasses is quite commonplace in the American Southwest. Even with all its natural, this is the article, says, even with all its natural defenses of thick, leathery, armor-like skin, the armadillo is consistently has consistently learned a little too late that the middle of the road is not the safest place to be. In fact, National Geographic reports that it is the nine-banded armadillo's hapless propensity for being run over by cars that has earned it the nickname Hillbilly Speed Bump. The middle of the road. If you stay in the middle of the road, you'll get run over. You'll miss it. Count Nicholas Zinzendorf founder of the Moravian movement, Christian movement, said, I have but one passion, it is him and him only. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 says, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. Let me ask you a question. Do you raise the spiritual temperature in the sanctuary? Do you raise the spiritual temperature in your family? Do you raise the spiritual temperature at your workplace? He says uh, in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself with the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. In other words, what he's saying is lukewarmness is not going to be solved internally because there needs to be an outside power source that comes in and moves on your life and, and heats things up again so that you can have a fire for God and you can echo the sentiment of Jeremiah and uh, Nicholas that up of the Moravian I have one passion and it's Jesus and there is but there is something that must be done from the outside it's not just a decision of the will there is more to solving the problem of lukewarmness because I know that it's a problem and I know that there's an issue of it and I find that my my uh, in my own journey and my walk with the Lord that I can drift back into that but I desire that there would be a heat oh God send the the fire may the fire fall again among us and in our lives so that we would experience not lukewarmness not being cold but being on fire buy from me he said gold refined by fire gold or uh, it goes through a refining process and in the refining process the heat is applied to bring what's called the dross or the impurities the other things in the gold that kind of come to the surface so they can scrape those things off sometimes the reason we shy away from the heat is not only because it's just easier not to but when we come to those places where the presence of God is so real and powerful he brings the dross of our hearts to the surface but the good news is he didn't just bring it there to expose it he brings it there so that he might wipe it away he might cleanse it from our lives praise the lord god will burn out all the other stuff he wants purity in the gold and then he says buy from me white garments he uh, earlier said to them you know the problem is that you're you think everything's fine but you're naked you're powerless without the spirit Lukewarmness makes us vulnerable to Satan's attacks. The fact that we are not near to the Lord, that our attention and our focus is not upon Him, uh, makes us susceptible to the storms of life, to being caught up in the waves and sinking in the water of the storms of life. Buy from me, he says, salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. There's even Christians who are blind to spiritual things. They don't even see. In fact, there are some people who may be even listening to this sermon who don't even see that their own spiritual lukewarmness has crept in and got a hold of their life and they are bound by it. They are consumed by it. It's, it's, it's got, 
its claws in them, and they have settled for, oh, I believe right, oh, I'm living decently, and all this, all this kind of thing, and they have settled for something less than the best that God has made available to them. They have settled for lukewarmness, and God's saying, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I want something more. I provided for something more. Jesus died and rose again for something more than spiritual lukewarmness. Praise God. Buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Lord, touch our eyes. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you want to do in our lack, our missing, where we're missing what you desire of us. You know, there's a difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer uh, simply tells you what the temperature is. Right? So if you look at a thermometer, it'll tell you whatever room you're in, if you're outside, if you put it in your mouth, uh, uh, it will tell you what your temperature is. It tells you how many degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit uh, that something is. It doesn't change it. It just is aware and tells you. It will tell you about the temperature. A thermostat, however, not only is able to figure out what the temperature is, but it does something more. It can actually help change the temperature. And it does that because once it evaluates what the temperature is, and then it will say, well, you know, the temperature is set on this, this, uh, this, these, this, these, this temperature should be what it should be, and this is what it is right now. And so what it'll do is either the, the heat or the, in, the, in the winter or the air conditioning in the summer will, tr will kick on to close the gap. So what the temperature of the room is and what uh, the, the, the set temperature, the desired temperature is, those things meet. I've, I've noticed uh, being a pastor now that there are a whole lots, lots of people you don't even have to be a Christian to be a thermometer in, in a church service. I think we can all tell, typically, well, we might be able to miss, maybe we might miss it sometimes, but typically when God moves in a mighty way, uh, there's lots of people who know God is working. Man, they so-and-so sang this song, and during worship, the altars were filled, or the sermon spoke powerfully, and God was ministering among us these things, and there's testimonies, or whatever it might look like. But it's evident, not just because of what it looks like, but the Spirit of God moving in a service. And I have found that even people who aren't Christians can be aware of that. In fact, there's people who aren't Christians who recognize, wow, the temperature, spiritual temperature in the church is going up right now. I'm in this place and it's happening right now. They know what's going on. They know what's taking place. They know what's happening. I don't think God calls us, though, to be thermometers. I think God calls us to be thermostats. In other words, our responsibility is not just to diagnose. Our responsibility is not just to evaluate what the current temperature is, but God's actually saying, I want you to raise the temperature wherever you might be. Where, wh whatever room you're in, whatever situation that you're in, the question is, uh, God moving through you, are you able not only to assess, oh, wow, this service is dead, it's cold, it's, it's just cold in here, and there's, there's no response to and uh, it just doesn't, it's hard to sense the Holy Spirit moving and to say, God, would you move through me? I know what the temperature ought to be in your house. I know what the temperature ought to be in my home. I know what the temperature ought to be at my workplace, and it's not there. And so, God, I'm asking, would you move through me to raise the temperature? May the, may the, may the church of the living God never succumb to freezing temperatures may we never though succumb to lukewarm temperatures but may we call upon god and say lord work through us today work through me today and lord bring the fire again in this place so that even those who come in the church they might be cold and maybe the preacher preaches just a dud sermon and maybe the singers sing and it's not that all that great or somebody doesn't and it's just subpar but god your presence is never subpar it's what 
what we need. It's what we long for. It's what we want. Lord, send your spirit to raise the temperature. To raise the temperature. I did a little research. Uh, I'll close with this. I did a little research <clears throat> at cold temperatures at 45 degrees. Uh, most everybody will go get a coat. Get a coat. And at 32 degrees, uh, water freezes. This, these are Fahrenheit, by the way. At 28 degrees, uh, skin is in danger of frostbite if it's left exposed for a, a amount of time. At negative 27 degrees Fahrenheit, ammonia changes from gas to liquid. At uh, at hot temperatures, at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you have uh, butter melting. The melting point of butter is 90 degrees. At 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you better turn on that AC. It's starting to get warm in there. Uh, five seconds of skin exposure at 140 degrees Fahrenheit leads to third degree burns. Just five seconds, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. At 212 degrees Fahrenheit, water boils. Do you know what happens at room temperature? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. What's your temperature? What's your temperature? If you are content to stay where you're at, at best, you will be lukewarm. Would you stand with me?